It's Tuesday, November 28th. It, Hamas frees 12 captives and Israel releases 30 Palestinian prisoners on the fifth day of a ceasefire in the Gaza war. Mediators are meeting in Qatar in hopes of extending the truce, which is due to end after one more exchange tomorrow night. The United States is urging Israel to better protect Palestinian civilians in Gaza if it follows through on its promise to resume the war. Oakland City Council unanimously passes a resolution calling for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza, joining about a dozen other cities and towns in the U.S. to do so, including Atlanta, Baltimore, Detroit, and Providence, Rhode Island. Authorities in Vermont weighing whether the shooting of three college students of Palestinian descent over the weekend was a hate crime. The victims were shot without provocation and injured Saturday while walking near the University of Vermont campus. The chair of the House Oversight Committee says an offer from Hunter Biden to testify publicly before Congress does not satisfy a subpoena they sent him amid an impeachment inquiry into his father, President Joe Biden. The political arm of the powerful conservative Koch Brothers Network endorses Nikki Haley's presidential campaign. The Sierra Club today announces its opposition to a billionaire-backed plan for a new city in Solano County. And jubilation in India today after rescuers pull out all 41 workers trapped for 17 days inside a collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas. From Pacifica Radio in the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Hamas and Israel released more captives and prisoners under terms of a fragile ceasefire that held for a fifth day today as international mediators in Qatar were working to extend the truce. And the United States urged Israel to better protect Palestinian civilians in Gaza if it follows through on its promise to resume the war there. In the latest swap since the ceasefire began last Friday, Israel said 10 of its citizens and two Thai nationals were freed by Hamas and had been returned to Israel soon after Israel released 30 Palestinian prisoners. The truce is due to end after one more exchange tomorrow night. Karen Chamas reports. Israel and Hamas have extended their truce, but it seems only a matter of time before the war resumes. A truce between Israel and Hamas has entered its fifth day. Both sides agreed to extend their truce through Wednesday, with another two planned exchanges of militant-held hostages for Palestinians imprisoned by Israel. The militant group has promised to release more civilian hostages to delay the expected resumption of the war. Israel is under growing pressure to spare Palestinian civilians when the fighting resumes. However, Israel has repeatedly vowed to resume fighting with full force, once it's clear that no more hostages will be freed under the current agreement's terms. I'm Karen Shamas. For the first time, Israel and Hamas blamed each other for an exchange of fire between troops and militants in northern Gaza. There was no indication, however, it would endanger the truce, which has enabled humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza. CIA Director William Burns and David Barnea, who heads Israel's Mossad intelligence agency, were in Qatar, a key mediator with Hamas, to discuss extending the ceasefire and releasing more prisoners and captives. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to visit the region this week. Israel has vowed to resume the war to end Hamas's 16-year rule in Gaza and crush its military capabilities once it's clear that no more hostages will be freed under the deal. That would almost certainly require expanding its ground offensive from northern Gaza to the south, where most of Gaza's population of 2.3 million is now crowded. It's unclear where they would go if Israel does so, as Egypt has refused to accept 
Palestinian refugees, and Israel has sealed its border. Hamas and other militant groups are believed to be holding enough captives to extend the truce potentially for two more weeks. Israel has vowed to resume the war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterating that goal today. But Qatar, which helped broker the ceasefire in the first place, is pushing for a permanent one. A foreign ministry spokesperson for Qatar translated by Al Jazeera. With respect to the extension of the ceasefire, the state of Qatar has been working from day one of this crisis to intensify mediation efforts with the aim of reaching a truce and then a permanent ceasefire. The extension we have in place now was part of the agreement where extension depends on the release of 10 captives by Hamas on a daily basis and we have confirmation that 20 can be released in the next 48 hours. In the meantime, we'll closely work with the concerned parties to have the truce extended in return for the confirmation from Hamas that they will continue to release captives. Meanwhile, if it comes to this, the Biden administration wants Israel to be more careful in its war-making when it resumes its assault on Gaza. Donna Warder reports. The Biden administration is telling Israel that when it resumes its ground campaign in Gaza, it must operate with greater precision. The Biden administration wants Israel to avoid more large-scale civilian casualties or mass displacement, like what occurred before the current temporary ceasefire. Israel's ground campaign is aimed at eradicating the Hamas militant group, but there's been international and domestic pressure about the rising Palestinian death toll, which is at more than 13,000 people. Meanwhile, the State Department says Secretary of State Antony Blinken plans to return to the Middle East this week as the U.S. hopes to find a way to further extend the ceasefire and get more hostages released. Donna Water, Washington. The United Children's United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, is calling for a ceasefire and for a lasting peace to the conflict, warning the situation is dire all around, but devastating for children particularly those with untreated war wounds. James Elder is a UNICEF spokesperson. So hospitals are full. They're overflowing. You know, the emergency wards with boys and girls, shrapnel wounds, horrendous burns. They're not just on hospital beds inside, but these incredible health staff, incredible doctors, nurses working around the clock. But they're out of space. It's a war zone. So you've got children in car parks, in gardens, on beds, everywhere. Then, of course, you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of children who are not in school, who are in very overcrowded camps, who are cold, it's starting to rain, who do not have enough food, do not have enough water, who are now at risk of of a disease outbreak. It's a horrendous situation. James Elder of UNICEF, some 6,000 children in Gaza have been killed since Israel began its bombing of Gaza, that after Hamas's attack on October 7th in southern Israel that killed some 1,200 people. The death toll in Palestine since has topped 14,000. The World Health Organization continues to evacuate patients from hospitals in northern Gaza. It says two of six health workers detained by Israeli forces during evacuations of patients last Friday have now been released. The director of the Al-Shifa Hospital and three others remain in custody of Israeli forces. The World Health Organization calling for their legal and human rights to be fully observed during their detention. In the Gaza Strip city of Rafa, a grassroots initiative by community members to feed thousands of displaced residents and others from northern Gaza is underway. Cooked food is being offered for free amidst a scarcity in the enclave of food supplies and a lack of both cooking gas and power supplies. Pacifica's Gaza correspondent Rami Almagari reports from Rafa. Here in the Tel Sultan neighborhood of Rafa city south of Gaza Strip, a few members of the local community has been cooking large quantities of lentils to at least 18,000 impoverished Palestinians and those displaced in the Tel Sultan neighborhood itself. 
Mahmoud Abdul Ali is a resident of the neighborhood. Mahmoud has been able to host the initiative at his own residential home. We are helping to enhance the steadfastness of our people because of the displacement of Jabaya, Beit Lahaya, and Beit Hanun. We provide meals based on support from local community organizations, including the Ministry of Social Affairs. These meals are served for free and dedicated for the support of women and children, who constitute 60% of the population. An estimated 18,000 Palestinians are benefiting from these meals. Our initiative is one of four similar initiatives in the Tel Sultan neighborhood. His son Ahmed is in charge of food cooking using firewood stoves amidst lack of power supply or cooking gas. It's been pretty hard work. We get up at 4 a.m. to get prepared for the day's work and fire the wood. The problem is that we don't even have enough water to cook this lentils dish. We do this work on our own, for no charge or wage. We just do it for the sake of helping people. Just a few feet away from Mahmoud's kitchen space, there is a newly designated safe shelter for displaced residents, mainly from Northern Gaza Strip. Mahmoud and a few other local guys carried a large vessel cooked lentils towards an under-construction non-governmental organization for people with disabilities. Raghda al Sharif is a resident of the northern Beit Lahia town. Raghda, along with her 20 member family, was forced to, to flee Israeli strikes a few days ago. Me and my family of 20 members came here under shelling. Shelling has been intensive over the past three days, to the extent that my son was hit by shrapnel. The situation is indescribable, as our doors and windows were shattered. I think our home is no longer there. Her husband has told Pacifica that the situation of war is the most horrible in the past 17 years of an Israel-imposed blockade of Gaza. May God bless those who initiated this good endeavor. I swear by God that I cannot afford this food right now. We came from there with only our clothes on us. We cannot bring any of our belongings from our home. I swear we slept on sand last night. And as you know, this is winter, and the weather is very cold. Not only displaced Palestinians who benefit from free for charge lentils meals, but also some other households in the local community. Saad Shahada is a nine-year-old boy who comes often to Mahmoud's kitchen to get some cooked food for his large family. I come here to help feed my whole family of 35 members. Sometimes we manage to eat some canned food. In the Gaza Strip, at least 900,000 Palestinians have been displaced from Gaza City and northern parts of Gaza Strip. All have been displaced at 170 UNRWA-run schools and facilities across the Gaza Strip. The UNRWA has been providing wheat and canned foods for the displaced residents. Since the Israeli war on Gaza has begun in October 7, the people of Gaza have been suffering from lack of power supplies, fuel and cooking gas. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami al in Gaza. Last night, Oakland City Council unanimously passed a resolution calling for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza, joining about a dozen other cities and towns across the country to do so. That includes Atlanta, Baltimore, Detroit, Providence, Rhode Island. Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! Some 1,200 residents packed the city council and overwhelmingly spoke in favor of the measure, including some who... Dissented. I am a Palestinian who has had family killed in Gaza by U.S. funded Israeli bombs, along with countless of others in this room and across the world who have lost family in Palestine. Today, I am calling on our city council to support this resolution as it is written, sending an unequivocal message that Oakland stands against genocide. I call on you to acknowledge that Hamas is responsible for the brutal 
murder, burning, tying together of children and families in their beds. And there's no amount of twisting words and alternative facts that's going to change that. My grandfather escaped the Nazis and then returned to Germany as an American soldier and he helped liberate concentration camps. And he saw firsthand like what violence you can do to other people when you dehumanize them. The Jewish people are not safer by denying life and sovereignty to Palestinians. No bombings in our name. Ceasefire now. There was some criticism the resolution did not include a condemnation of Hamas's attack on southern Israel on October 7th, which set off the latest Israeli bombardment of Gaza. Council member Dan Kalb voiced his concern. Not even clearly mentioning the Hamas mass murder on October 7th is sending the wrong message and an embarrassing message. Hamas has stated publicly on the air that they want to engage in similar atrocities in Israel over and over again and again. They've said that. Those who failed, you're right, boo. Uh, those who failed to condemn the actions of Hamas on October 7th clearly are, are condoning. Okay, let, let's I, I allow him to speak, now. please. Are, are condoning please. their actions. His amendments to include a Hamas condemnation were voted down, and he ultimately voted for the overall resolution. Councilmember Carol Fife, who represents West Oakland, introduced the resolution and explained her reasoning. It didn't name either, it didn't name condemnation of Hamas. It didn't name condemnation of Israel because we wanted to focus on love life and lifting up what we support and not what we condemn. So it intentionally tried to bring sides together that I've been working with, that I've been in conversation with, in the Jewish community and the Muslim community to say we support life. And in order for a lasting peace to occur, the, the, the shooting, the bombings, all of these things have to stop. A small number of pro-Israeli activists gathered and called the resolution inflammatory, but Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, who sits on the Rabbinic Council for the Jewish Voice for Peace group, which turned out in large numbers to support the resolution, stressed the need for peace. Some called for the resolution to unambiguously call for an end to the war, The resolution calls for a, quote, immediate ceasefire, release of all hostages, the unrestricted entry of humanitarian assistance into Gaza, the restoration of food, water, electricity, and medical supplies to Gaza, and the respect for international law. And it calls for a resolution to the conflict that protects the security of all innocent civilians. A man pled not guilty to attempted murder yesterday in connection with the weekend shooting of three Palestinian and Palestinian-American college students in Burlington, Vermont, an attack that's being investigated as a possible hate crime. 48-year-old Jason Eaton was arrested on Sunday, pled not guilty yesterday to three counts of attempted murder that would send him to life in prison. Sarah George is Chittenden County State's Attorney. These are three life felonies. And although we do not yet have evidence to support a hate crime enhancement, I do want to be clear that there is no question this was a hateful act. The three young men were shot and injured Saturday while walking near the University of Vermont campus. Two were wearing Palestinian scarves. One is from Palestine. The family said they thought he would be safer in the United States. Rich Price and Roddy Tamimi are uncles of two of the men who were shot. Kenan grew up in the West Bank, and we always thought that that could be more of a risk uh, in terms of his safety. And sending him here would be a you know, uh, the right decision, and we feel somehow betrayed in that decision. Speaks to the level of civic vitriol, uh, speaks to the level of uh, uh, hatred that exists uh, in some corners of this, of this country, 
It speaks to a sickness of gun violence that exists in this country. Two of the wounded were struck in the torso while one was hit in the lower extremities. Two of them were in stable condition today. The other suffered much more serious injuries. All three remain hospitalized. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The United States Senate will take up President Biden's request for Ukraine funding this week, an issue Republicans want to tie to funding for more security crackdowns at the border with Mexico. But the Democrats have rejected, setting up a showdown over partisan politics. Senate leader Democrat Chuck Schumer warned Republicans not to stonewall the president's emergency request for $105 billion in aid for Ukraine, Israel, and other U.S. allies. The worst thing we can do right now, the worst thing we can do, is to make something as bipartisan as Ukraine aid conditional on partisan issues that have little chance of becoming law. Sadly, that's what may well be happening right now, because the biggest holdup to, national, to the national security supplement is an insistence by some Republicans, just some, on partisan border policy as a condition for Ukraine aid. This has injected a decades-old hyper-partisan issue into overwhelmingly bipartisan priorities. That $105 billion request also includes $14 billion to bolster the immigration system and border security. Money would go toward hiring more Border Patrol agents, immigration judges, and asylum officers. It's part of Biden's compromise strategy to turn away from former President Donald Trump's hardline immigration policies. But Republicans in the House have passed legislation that would detain families at the border, require migrants to make the, their asylum claim at an official port of entry, and either detain them or require them to remain outside of the United States while their asylum case is proceeding. Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell today doubled down on the Republican demands for tougher border security. The biggest holdup for passing a national security supplemental. Well, he's right about one thing the single largest obstacle in the way of urgent resources to help Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan is Democrats' refusal to address the crisis at the southern border. National security begins right here at home. And the, senior, and the sooner our colleagues admit it, the sooner the Senate can move forward on the urgent business. A small bipartisan group of senators is trying to find a compromise that could win the necessary 60 votes in the Senate. But even if senators can find agreement, there's no guarantee it would pass the Republican-controlled House. Republicans are hoping Democrats will feel political pressure after undocumented border crossings topped a daily average of more than 8,000 earlier this fall. Catherine Carley reports. Back from Thanksgiving, lawmakers are debating President Joe Biden's $100 billion Israel and Ukraine aid package. Speaker Johnson says he's confident Congress can get to a deal on it, but funds for Ukraine must come with changes to border policy. I think most of our Senate colleagues recognize that those two things need to move together because we owe that to the American people. That's what they're demanding that we do. Johnson's plan to pay for just aid to Israel by cutting the IRS died in the Senate. Hardline Republicans still want budget cuts to offset the Ukraine funds, and Vermont progressive Bernie Sanders says aid for Israel should demand steps to stop the fighting. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Finland says it will close its last remaining border crossing with Russia amid concerns that Moscow is using migrants as part of hybrid warfare to destabilize the Nordic country following its entry into NATO. Finland already had shut down seven of its eight border checkpoints on a 830-mile border with Russia this month following a surge in migrant arrivals. This month, Finnish authorities say about 900 crossed from Russia, an unusual increase. Prime Minister Pateri Orpo said his country has a profound reason to suspect that the influx has been orchestrated. 
The powerful Koch Brothers Political Action Committee has thrown its support behind Republican presidential candidate, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. The endorsement represents a boost to Haley's campaign and a rejection of frontrunner Donald Trump's style of politics. Benji Heyer reports. She's described by AFP Action in its endorsement as someone who can turn the page and win, allowing the American people to move on from the current political era. The Conservative Network claims its internal polling shows the former South Carolina governor and former ambassador to the United Nations is in the best position to defeat Donald Trump in the primaries, despite still trailing the former president as he vies for the Oval Office again. And that's Benji Heyer reporting more on the Nikki Haley campaign from reporter Julie Walker. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley argues Donald Trump is always followed by too much chaos to be successful in a second White House term. The former South Carolina governor and U.N. ambassador drew the largest crowd of her primary campaign so far in her home state on Monday, where she said she believes now is the time for a new generation in U.S. leadership, which is her while well, before Donald Trump was the right president at the right time. The truth is, right or wrong, chaos follows him. You know, right? Chaos follows him. While Haley has been picking up endorsements out of the Republican field, Trump is the front runner. I'm Julie Walker. Hunter Biden offered today to testify publicly before Congress, striking a defiant note in response to a subpoena from Republicans and setting up a potential confrontation as a separate special counsel's probe gets underway. The Democratic president's son slammed the subpoena's request for closed-door testimony, saying that can be manipulated. But Representative James Comer of Kentucky, the chair of the House Oversight Committee, insisted Republicans expect full cooperation with their original demand for a deposition. Hunter Biden's lawyer called the inquiry a fishing expedition, a response in line with the more forceful legal approach he's taken in recent months as congressional Republicans pursue an impeachment inquiry seeking to tie his father, Joe Biden, to his business dealings. Sagar Magani reports from Washington. President Biden's son is offering to testify publicly before Congress after a subpoena from House Republicans looking into nearly every part of his business dealings. The House Oversight Committee subpoena demanded that Hunter Biden sit for it deposition. He's refusing to appear behind closed doors, but says he would answer pertinent and relevant questions in public next month, setting up a potential high-stakes face-off. The panel's chair, though, is not backing down saying the GOP expects full cooperation with the deposition demand. The probe of Hunter Biden's dealings comes as Republicans pursue an impeachment inquiry into his father. So far, they have not uncovered any evidence directly implicating President Biden in any wrongdoing. Sagar Magani at the White House. Recent polling from the New York Times and Siena College has found President Biden trailing former President Donald Trump in five of the six most crucial battleground states, one of which is Arizona. In the Grand Canyon state, Trump leads Biden by five percentage points. Alex Gonzalez reports. Elaine Kamar with the Brookings Institution says despite polls showing Biden slipping compounded with his unfavorable approval rating, does that mean voters won't vote for him and other Democrats in the upcoming election? She says it isn't a simple answer. Maybe there's just no relationship between the president's popularity and down ballot voting, that voters vote on on very different things. And maybe we just because we have a president centric kind of culture, maybe we just get that wrong all the time. While the New York Times Siena College poll comprised just over 3,600 registered voters among all six states, Kamar says other state-based polls which struck fear in many Democrats are composed only of about 600 participants, which she says likely aren't grasping the entirety of voters' preferences and true attitudes. Kamar says looking at the special elections in 2021, the midterms in 2022, and the most recent set of elections this year, President Biden's unpopularity does not have much to do with Democratic votes. She can 
contends Democrats overperformed expectations in all three years and increased their margins. She argues abortion is a huge motivator for Democratic voters. Arizona is among one of several states looking at a possible proposed abortion rights measure on next year's ballot, which could boost Democrats' chances. Where the right to choose is front and center on the agenda. Abortion is an incredibly powerful motivator. I think in my lifetime in politics, which has been pretty long, it's probably the biggest push I've ever seen, really. Arizona for Abortion Access is supported by a coalition of reproductive rights advocates who are currently working on getting the close to 400,000 signatures from Arizona voters by July of next year. Currently, abortions are legal in Arizona up to 15 weeks with no exceptions for rape or incest. The law does have have an exception to save the life of a pregnant mother. I'm Alex Gonzalez. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekends. All of our newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. House Speaker Mike Johnson's decision to publicly release thousands of hours of Capitol security footage from the January 6, 2021 insurrection has fueled a renewed effort by Republican lawmakers and far right wing activists to rewrite the history of the attack and to exonerate the pro Trump rioters who took part. Johnson's move last week to make the footage available, something the far right has long demanded, came as he tried to allay the anger of hardline Republican lawmakers for working with Democrats to keep the government funded. Now, some of the same people who were irate about that decision are using the January 6th video to circulate an array of false claims and conspiracy theories about the largest attack on the Capitol in centuries. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, the hard-right Georgia Republican, was among the first lawmakers to post false information about the newly released videos. She claimed on the social media site X that surveillance videos showed a rioter holding a law enforcement badge in his hand, suggesting he was an undercover police officer disguised as a Trump supporter, and the attack was an inside job. But the item in the man's hand in the screen grab she circulated appears, upon closer inspection, to have been a vape pen. And the man who's seen in that image, Kevin Lyons, was in fact a heating and cooling technician, not a police officer, who was later convicted at a public trial of multiple federal charges and sentenced to more than four years in prison. Congresswoman Green later edited her post to remove the false claim, but not before it had spread widely among Trump supporters. Senator Mark Lee, Mike Lee, Republican of Utah, recirculated the same clip and the same false allegation that the man pictured had flashed a badge, adding that he looked forward to questioning Christopher Wray, the FBI director, about the matter. How many of these guys are feds, he asked in a separate post that included video of a violent clash between rioters and the police. Heads up, former Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who was the top Republican on the special House committee that investigated the January 6th attack, responded to Senator Lee, telling him that a nutball conspiracy theorist appears to be posting from your account. Others, such as Donald Trump Jr., have shared video of rioters walking through the Capitol hallways doing nothing violent, suggesting that those who entered the building were entirely peaceful. But other videos from that day show some of the same people at other moments storming the building and attacking police officers. More in this report, filed by Catherine Carley. You know, when you see the footage yourself, it's going to give you an understanding of what was there and what occurred that day, because we're currently only depending upon really partisan descriptions of what happens. Now the American people can see. House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner of Ohio calls the release of 40,000 hours of video from the January 6th Capitol attack an important step for the truth. Speaker Mike Johnson ordered the video be gradually posted on a House website, despite objections from Capitol Police that it could pose a security risk. Turner, a Republican, says lawmakers from both parties have cherry-picked the footage. His comment came when asked about Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia calling the attack an inside job by the Capitol Police themselves. 
Colorado Congressman Ken Buck says if his fellow Republicans want to solve America's problems, they have to face some unpleasant truths. Everyone who makes the argument that January 6th was, uh, you know, an unguided tour of the Capitol is lying to America. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Sandy Hook families who won nearly $1.5 billion in legal judgments against conspiracy theorist Alex Jones for calling the 2012 Connecticut school shooting massacre a hoax have offered to settle that debt for only pennies on the dollar, $85 million over 10 years. The offer was made in Jones's personal bankruptcy case in Houston last week. In a legal filing, lawyers for the family said they believed the proposal was a viable way to help resolve the bankruptcy reorganization cases of both Jones and his company, Free Speech Systems. But in the sharply worded document, the attorneys continued to accuse the InfoWars host of failing to curb his personal spending and extravagant lifestyle, failing to preserve the value of his holdings, refusing to sell assets, and failing to produce certain financial documents. In other words, doing absolutely nothing to adhere to the court's judgment against him. Last month, a Texas judge ruled that Jones cannot use bankruptcy protections as a means to evade paying money to Sandy Hook families. He has to pay $1.1 billion to the families who sued him due to his espousing of conspiracy theories claiming the mass shooting was a hoax. Lisa Dwyer reports. In multiple legal judgments, Sandy Hook families won nearly $1.5 billion against conspiracy theorist Alex Jones for calling the 2012 Connecticut school shooting a hoax. Those families now have offered to settle that debt for only pennies on the dollar, at least $85 million over 10 years. 20 children and six educators were killed in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. The families say Jones's followers threatened and harassed them and even confronted the grieving families in person, accusing them of being crisis actors whose children never existed. During a court hearing in Houston, Jones's bankruptcy lawyer suggested that that $85 million settlement offer was too high and unrealistic for Jones to pay. In a sharply worded document, the family's attorneys continued to accuse Jones of failing to curb his personal spending and extravagant lifestyle. I'm Lisa Dwyer. The nation's epidemic of gun violence was the topic of a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing today. Democrats are pushing for funding to study the issue like a public health crisis. Republicans opposing the move. Christina Onestead reports. Senate Judiciary Chair Illinois Democrat Dick Durbin opened the hearing with graphic images of bloody classrooms from school mass shootings, blood-soaked streets, and children walking with their arms above their heads out in school. Across the country, gun violence is a public health epidemic, plain and simple. In 2022, there were more than 48,000 firearm-related deaths in the United States. That's 132 Americans every day dying from gun violence. More than half of firearm-related deaths were suicides. More than four out of 10 were homicides. And guns are now the number one cause of death among America's children and teenagers. Not auto accidents, not cancer, guns. According to the Gun Violence Archives, this year the U.S. has had more than 39,000 gun deaths and another 33,000 gun injuries. That includes more than 5,500 child and teenage gun deaths and injuries. About 1,000 of those are under the age of 11. On average, that's about 20 children in each state so far this year. We are turning into a nation of traumatized survivors. Dr. Megan Rainey is an emergency physician and the dean at Yale's School of Public Health. Fifteen years ago, she co-founded a firm at the Aspen Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to applying public health solutions to gun violence. I have treated people for every type of firearm injury, from domestic violence to victims of drive-bys. I've saved some lives, but not all, and have informed countless families of the loss of their loved ones. And it is because I have had a front row seat to our nation's growing firearm injury epidemic that I have worked to define and implement a public health approach to this crisis. First, we gather data on the problem. How common is it and who is affected? 
Second, we define risk and protective factors. What increases or decreases the chance of someone being hurt or dying? Third, we figure out programs that work to change those patterns, to avert injury, hospitalization, or death. And finally, we scale what works. Rainey's calling on Congress to fund a public health approach to gun violence, including research and prevention. She says a public health approach model has helped policymakers redress social problems while retaining related rights, like reducing vehicle accidents 70 percent over the last few decades, while increasing the number of cars on the road. But Republicans remain skeptical and called the hearing an attempt to erode the Second Amendment like Ted Cruz of Texas. Their priority is not stopping the criminals. Their priority is disarming law-abiding citizens. And by the way, they call it a public health crisis because they want to put supposed experts in charge of disarming you. And Louisiana Republican John Kennedy, who had this exchange with Dr. Rainey. You, you equated gun deaths to heart disease in your opening statement. Yes, sir. Which is a greater public health problem, gun deaths or heart disease? So heart disease does kill more folks across the United States, largely in the about end of their life. About 700,000? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gun deaths, about 50,000? Correct. Do you, do you support outlawing fried foods? I, I'm sorry. How does that relate to... Because fried foods contribute to heart disease, don't they? Again, I have not written or said that I I'm support sure outlawing. You're a physician, right? I am. Have I said that I support outlawing anything in my testimony today? Okay. Rainey also urged greater community collaboration, including firearm owners, to help gather data and best practices. And despite the partisan divide over gun violence, Rainey says she remains hopeful lawmakers will act in a bipartisan way. That happened one year ago when President Joe Biden signed into law the Safer Communities Act breaking decades of a stalemate on gun control. That legislation was passed in the wake of the deadliest school shooting in more than a decade in the U.S., in Uvalde, Texas. It increased funding for mental health services, school security initiatives, and expanded criminal background checks for certain gun buyers and barred a large number of domestic violence offenders from being able to purchase firearms. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. The Texas Supreme Court is hearing a challenge to the state's near-total abortion ban. Some 20 women are suing, claiming the law denied them medical care and put their lives at risk when their pregnancies became complicated. Tony Waterman reports. Texas's abortion ban has one exception. The mother's life needs to be in danger. But the women in this case say the language is so vague that doctors who risk life in prison if they are found to have performed an illegal abortion are unwilling to allow the procedure, even when the fetus has no chance of survival. It's the first major challenge to the Texas law. The conservative court won't decide on the law itself, but whether to uphold a lower court's injunction exempting pregnant women with risky pregnancies from the ban. Tony Waterman, Texas. The A's may be leaving Oakland for Las Vegas, but that doesn't mean Oakland will be without professional baseball. A group of East Bay baseball fans and investors today announced they're forming a minor league expansion team called the Oakland Ballers, or Bees for short, which will begin play next spring in the independent Pioneer League. Max Pringle reports. The new team introduced itself to the Bay Area with a slickly produced video touting its home city's grit and resilience. Oakland is ready for a new baseball team. Oakland needs a new baseball team. We're going to have baseball here. We're not going to let anyone else dictate of what we can and can't have here in Oakland. So what they trying to steal from us, we steal it back. Baseball in Oakland, baby. 2024. The, the Ballers will the be the first field. West Coast franchise in the Pioneer League, which mainly plays in the Rockies region. Brian Carmel is co-founder of the Oakland Ballers, also known as the Bees. Carmel said despite the fact that Oakland has lost the NFL's Raiders, the NBA's Warriors, and now MLB's A's, rumors that Oakland is no longer a major league city are false. You know, there's been a lot of talk that Oakland can't get it done. That maybe Oakland's not a pro sports town. 
Well, we're here to tell you today that we reject that notion full stop. Oakland Mayor Xing Tao was in attendance at the Oakland Ballers' official launch. She said the starting of the new team sends the message that Oakland baseball fans are stepping in to fill the void left by the A's leaving town. This is what One Oakland is about. This is how we do it here in the town, is we are stepping up and we're giving our community uh, a sense of hope. The Ballers will have experienced baseball professionals at the helm, hiring former A's coach and Seattle Mariners manager Don Wakamatsu as executive vice president. Wakamatsu told ABC7 sports personality Casey Pratt's podcast that the Bees will be able to attract rising young stars, given the team's location in a major metro area. You don't get this opportunity uh, very often to be able to put an independent club in a metropolitan city with this kind of visibility. Visibility for our franchise, but more importantly, for these young players that want to go on. I mean, one of the first things they ask us when we go talk about signing players is, well, are our scouts going to see us? Well, if they don't see us here in Oakland, they won't get a chance to see you anywhere. San Francisco native Mika Phillips, who played professionally for 15 years, will be the team's first manager. Noted Oakland hip-hop star, business owner, and community organizer Mr. Fab has thrown his support behind the bees. He said the team's founder's vision to support youth baseball in Oakland made him a believer. And when I talked to the fellas and they said, man, we want to bring in not only the Oakland bees, but we want to help back, bring back childhood baseball and T-ball and Babe Ruth, and I was sold. The Bees ownership group has already raised $2 million in seed money for getting up and running and for expanding seeding at Laney College's baseball field, which will be their new home. The Bees also sought out fan input. Jorge Leon as head of the Oakland A's fan group, the Oakland 68s, one of the groups that helped organize the A's reverse boycott, calling on A's owner John Fisher to sell the A's to a local group. He said the fan relationship with the B's will be much different than it was with the A's. We feel like it was always being taken advantage of, um, and I think this is a, 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 a great time, a great start to like finally taking that sport back and giving it back to the community. The B's will sport the familiar Oakland green and gold worn by the A's since coming west in 1968. The B's begin play in the 12-team Pioneer League next May. Their first home game is scheduled for early June. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This music break is brought to you by Bebop, Kubop, and The Musical Truth with host of Vacha, which airs Tuesdays at 8 p.m. We now return to the Pacifica Evening News. The Sierra Club today announced its opposition to a billionaire-backed plan for a new city in Solano County. The environmental group characterized the project as a clandestine possession because the backers of the plan did not follow the area's smart use planning and the voter-approved orderly growth initiative. Princess Washington is the chair of the Sierra Club Solano Group. She said that Flannery LLC's California Forever proposal was not transparent with the community about who's funding the project and whether it fits in with the county's land use plan. California Forever answers the question, why did they buy so much land and why did they not involve the community earlier? They answered that they knew that to build a complete, sustainable community, they would need to assemble a large building and that only, if the only way to avoid a rush of reckless short-term land speculation 
was to not share their specific plans until they finished acquiring the properties. What they failed to mention is that the county of Solano County has an orderly growth initiative in place. Backers of the proposed new city want to put a measure on the November ballot next year to allow the development to go forward. If it makes it onto the ballot, Solano County voters would need to approve it. Fairfield Mayor Catherine Moy said that the money being spent on the California Forever plan should instead go to tackle social problems like homelessness in Solano County. We have a homeless problem. Let's feed the homeless here. Where's the money? You guys are just there to make yourself more money, and it sickens me. That's not who we are here. Understand who we are. The Sierra Club said that the California Forever Project threatens to undo years of local and regional growth planning and would also damage the environment. Princess Washington with the Sierra Club also said that the project is incompatible with the Nature-Based Solutions Executive Order signed by Governor Newsom in October of 2020, which aims to fight climate change. California's natural and working land are forests, rangelands, farmlands, wetlands, coasts, deserts, and urban green spaces sustain our economy, support our unique to biodiversity, contribute to the global food supply, support outdoor heritage, and provide clean water and air. California Forever issued a statement saying that the opponents are entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. By giving voters the final say, this project explicitly adheres to the orderly growth initiative, it said, by asking Solano voters whether they want to turn an area with the least productive and least ecologically valuable soils in all of Solano County into a new economic engine for the county. And that's a quote. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors has some extra time to change the way the city is regulating market rate housing developments. The supervisors had been scheduled to vote today on a controversial change to the city's planning code aimed at meeting a state requirement to speed up housing construction. Critics say the measure proposed by Mayor London Breed would boost upscale home construction working against the city's commitment to affordable housing. Christopher Martinez reports. When the San Francisco Board of Supervisors met Tuesday afternoon, perhaps the most pressing issue on the agenda was a proposed ordinance to meet a state deadline for streamlining the construction of market-rate housing. Pressing because the deadline had already passed on Thanksgiving. But when the item came up for discussion, Supervisor Mirna Emelgar said 45 minutes earlier a state corrective action letter had arrived from the folks at the State Housing Development Department, giving the city a new deadline. And so I just want to make sure that we all understand that we are within the time frame. We are cutting it close. However, uh, this is a complicated city. Supervisor Rafael Mandelman made a motion to delay the vote on the proposed ordinance for a week. He says one of his concerns is that it could lead to streamlining the construction of what he calls monster home developments at the expense of affordable housing. I still think there's a way to regulate um, to avoid monster homes uh, in the central neighborhoods that I represent. Um, but to do that, we needed to amend the uh, streamlining legislation. And to do that, procedurally, we needed to send that proposal back to planning. That proposal is going to be heard at the Planning Commission on Thursday. So I think it can come back to us for action um, as part of this uh, approval next week. State legislation requires cities to streamline their rules to speed up development projects or else face the loss of state affordable housing funds. Under that threat, the San Francisco measure had been expected to pass easily. And with the vote now delayed, it's still expected to. Supervisor Matt Dorsey is a co-sponsor of the proposed ordinance. He said he'd save his remarks for the next meeting, but he did offer some thoughts. When we have the option of playing by the rules, I think it's a good idea to to do so. Um, I would rather that San Francisco be an example of how to um, comply with our obligations under state law than in a cautionary tale of how not to. 
The proposed ordinance aims at speeding up construction of market rate housing by easing rules on things like public hearings, height limits, and open space requirements. Critics say it guts city planning rules, incentivizes upscale market rate development, and would worsen the city's already difficult problems of gentrification and displacement. Supervisor Connie Chan is a co author of a resolution calling on the city to request a state deadline extension, along with changes to keep more local power over housing decisions. She notes the policies and city funding that San Francisco has already devoted to affordable housing. We have done everything that we can、uh, time and time again to prove that both in policy and money that we, we are you know, in the best interest of San Francisco to also comply in these state laws. But I, I, it seems like it's never enough.、Um, and so I, I'm just going to stop right here and, and, and just disappointed to see how this continues to unfold,、uh, the, the, how that the goalposts and continue to move away from us. The board is now scheduled to take up the proposed ordinance at its meeting on December 5th. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Rescuers today pulled out all 41 workers trapped for 17 days inside a collapsed tunnel in the Himalayas after drilling through the debris of rock, concrete, and earth to reach them, triggering jubilation across India. The evacuation of the men. Low wage workers from some of India's poorest states began more than six hours after rescuers broke through the debris in the tunnel. Karen Chamas filed this report. Indian rescuers have pulled out all 41 workers who were trapped in a tunnel for 17 days. <laughs> Ambulance sirens blare out at the site of the collapsed tunnel in Uttarakhand state in northern India. 41 workers were rescued from the collapsed mountain tunnel after being trapped in there for over two weeks. The workers were pulled out through a passageway made of welded pipes that rescuers previously pushed through dirt and rocks. About a dozen men had worked overnight to manually dig through rock and debris using handheld digging tools. The drilling machine initially used broke down after boring through nearly 154 feet. The men became trapped after a landslide caused a portion of the tunnel they were building to collapse. They survived on food and oxygen supplied through narrow steel pipes. I'm Karen Chamas. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter was memorialized today in Atlanta. Her husband, former President Jimmy Carter, President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and First Lady Jill Biden joined former First Ladies Laura Bush, Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, and Melania Trump in paying tribute to her at the service. More from reporter Julie Walker. Up three days of events, which began yesterday with a ceremony paying tribute to her. Today, Rosalind Carter will be celebrated again with a rare gathering of all living U.S. First Ladies and multiple presidents, including her 99 year old husband, Jimmy Carter, who has been on hospice care but has vowed to attend today's service, as well as President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden. Tomorrow, a private funeral will be held. Rosalind Carter died November 19th at home in Plains, Georgia, at the age of 96. I'm Julie Walker. Cloudy tomorrow morning around the San Francisco Bay Area. Sunny by the afternoon with highs in the low 60s. In Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, partly cloudy skies with highs in the mid 60s. That is it for the news tonight for this Tuesday, November 28th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Howard Zinn. Orwell said that whoever controls the past controls the future.、Uh, and whoever controls the present controls the past. So whoever is in charge of our society can decide、uh, what our history will look like. And by deciding what our history will look like, they will decide our future. Well, that made history very important to me because it, it meant that history was not disengaged from society, that to create a more democratic history meant that, that you were 
at least playing some part in uh, trying to create uh, a more democratic society. Storytelling for social change on KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.